I'm joined now by General Terence O'Shaughnessy. He is the commander of United States Northern Command and also of North American Airspace Defense Command. And he's leading the Department of Defense, their operations to combat the coronavirus in the United States. And he would lead the country through the aftermath in the worst case scenario. So, uh, General O'Shaughnessy, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for allowing us to tell a little bit of some of the things we're doing in our coordinated national response. So I'm going to get to that in a second because clearly there's a big, big uh, call for that. But can you first explain to the American people what, need, what would happen, what would need to happen to, you know, sort of have you as the designated survivor, so to speak, to, to lead through a period if, um, if there was a worst-case scenario. What would that worst-case scenario be? How would you lead? What would be the authority to do so? Well, to be very clear, the, the things that we're doing here now within the United States are to avoid any catastrophic events uh, such as that. In fact, uh, the great work that we're doing with the National Task Force that's really been approaching this with a whole of America approach is really designed in order to be able to put all of the capacity of our United States of America uh, put to bear on this uh, very challenging uh, problems that we've been faced with. But what would be the circumstance? Because you've got that designation for a reason. So what would be the worst case scenario? I mean, does it have to be the whole top layer of government incapacitated? What, what, would, what would it need to invoke your leadership, so to speak? Yeah, I think maybe there's been some exaggerated stories of uh, some of the uh, authorities there. What we're really looking at is uh, I'm leading the Department of Defense's operational efforts here within the United States. We also contribute to the, what we call continuity of government uh, to ensure that we always have the ability to uh, have our nation led by our, our elected officials. Uh, and so we're, we play a role in that and uh, a very important role. But our whole intent here is that we, we, we want to make sure that our country is able to get through this, prevail, be on the other side, end up stronger than we are today. Okay, so tell us what is the role of the U.S. military in fighting this enemy from within? Obviously, we all know that the U.S. military is deployed to fight an external enemy. What is your role in this situation right now? Yeah, let me start by just talking a little bit about our command, and that is uh, the northern, uh, U.S. Northern Command. Our, our, our primary focus is defending the homeland, if you will, and so whilst I've certainly been stationed all over the world and, and been engaged in a lot of different operations, our focus of our command is right here at home to defend against whatever the threats happen to be, and as you well know, our Commander-in-Chief has declared war on COVID-19, and so as such, uh, we're really treating this as a military campaign right here at home uh, in order to mobilize all of the assets that the Department of Defense has uh, to be able to be part of this whole nation uh, effort that we have to combat this virus. And as you mentioned, this is challenging. This, this is really a threat that is unseen uh, but can be very devastating. And so we're, we're ensuring that we're part of that whole nation approach, but we're tied in all the way to the White House task force that the vice president has been leading and the president often uh, comes into. Uh, all the way down to our National Response Coordination Center that FEMA is leading. Uh, we're plugged into all that, and we're making sure that we're able to put our efforts and, and our capability exactly where they're needed. The thing is, as you know, there's been calls from various different governors, certainly from New York and elsewhere, where, where things are very bad, and they have wanted the military to deploy, and there's a, a certain feeling that there's a slowness in that like, you know, moving ventilators, for instance, or using the Army logistics, which are unparalleled, um, even the Army Corps of Engineers, which I know have been deployed to an extent in New York and the Javits Center and elsewhere. But there is a feeling that um, the military has been somewhat slow, and even from the Pentagon we're hearing that there are thousands of ventilators could, that could be shipped out, but they don't know where to ship them. Well, I mean, how is that even possible when specific governors are screaming for them? Yeah, let me, let me take that one at a time. So when we start with the ventilators, the uh, Department of Defense has done a look at all of the capability we have to include our ventilators, and we've made them available to the national effort. And uh, in this particular case, we've made them available to HHS, and they're distributing them as they need be uh, based on the, the demand signal. And one of the challenges we do have, and understand that each individual governor has their needs, uh, we have to look at this at a holistic national level. And so all of those requests are actually coming through the National Response Coordination Center, that's led by FEMA, the FEMA Administrator, Pete Gaynor. And I'm in daily contact with him, sometimes hourly, with respect to where are those demand signals. And so 
what the approach that we've taken, I don't mean we mm -hmm. the DOD, but we as a nation, is to drive things through that process and that way we're ensuring that the, the most, uh, the, the most uh, demand, uh, the most compelling demand is actually the one that we're responding to. And what we're also able to do, you mentioned the logistics of this, is we're using uh, both the FEMA capability uh, and our national capability to ensure we get the right things to the right place at the right time. And, and, and I know there's been a, just an absolutely tremendous effort in, to ensure that. And, and while we see a lot about New York, we see a lot about some of the bigger um, uh, areas that have been affected, we, we're concerned about the whole nation. And so part of it is how do we distribute the, all the capability, not just to one or two cities, but all across our great nation. Just very briefly, what do you think is most needed right now and where is it most needed and what will the military be doing to deliver it? Yeah, that's a great question. And right now, the, the, the biggest demand signal is for medical capability. No surprise there. Uh, it's, it's both the facilities, and you mentioned our Army Corps of Engineers and the great work that they're doing, converting convention centers and all sorts of different locations to have a capability to, to actually house some of the patients that we're expecting. But even more important than that, it's the healthcare workers. It's the, it's the medical expertise. And that is something that we have some capability within the Department of Defense, surely, and we're making that available. And that's why you see, for example, the comfort uh, in New York City, the Mercy uh, in California. We have three different Army hospitals that we've deployed, both to New York City and to Washington. Uh, we're literally deploying now uh, two additional areas, Louisiana and uh, Dallas, where we're bringing some of our naval medical capability. And so we are spreading that all across the nation. And again, that goes through the prioritization process. Uh, that is being run by the, the National Response Coordination Center. But, but right now, the biggest demand signal is, is really about the healthcare workers, and that's why we're trying to make as much available as we can uh, as part of the national effort. But this is going to be a challenge going forward, and, and I tell you, I have to salute those healthcare workers because they're going to the sound of gunfire, right? They're going and in, in knowingly into harm's way in order to be able to provide the comfort, the medical attention, uh, and the services that, that our nation needs right now. And so my hat's off to them. Uh, absolutely, and I know the USS Roosevelt is not under your command, but there are dozens and dozens of confirmed cases on that uh, aircraft carrier. It's in Guam, at the port of Guam, and, you know, the, the captain has, has said, we're not at war there, you know, we're not at war right now, and yet, you know, we, we risk losing some of our sailors and this shouldn't be happening. Is there a plan to evacuate that aircraft character, ca uh, carrier? Rather, what, is, what do you know could could uh, try alleviate that situation? Yeah, I'm certainly tracking uh, the situation with the Theodore Roosevelt, and, and what I would do is, is really highlight the things that we're doing right here at home. You know, that's, a, that's a microcosm, it's uh, one, one example, but it really it does uh, highlight the fact that we in the United States military, as well as, for example, the healthcare workers and so many other essential services, we, we can't just uh, go home, right? We, we have to provide this service, we have to defend our homeland. And so what we're really focused on here uh, within U.S. Northern Command and NORAD is how do we, even given the virus uh, and, the, and the situation that it's bringing us, how do we fight through that? And not only to support the efforts to uh, combat the virus, but how do we defend our homeland? Uh, for example, we, we had Russian aviation flying off of Alaska last week. We had to be able to respond to that. We need to maintain our ability to respond. And so though in order to do that, what we're doing is we call it mission assurance. We're doing everything possible to ensure mission assurance. And a couple quick examples I'd give you is we We've actually taken a bunch of our most critical crews. We've taken them away from their families. We're building in our own uh, uh, kind of equivalent of a hotel room right here on the bases. Uh, and then they are going to what we call Cheyenne Mountain. Cheyenne Mountain was actually, it was built for a nuclear war. It was built to survive a nuclear war. And so we have, we have crews in there that are operating out of Cheyenne Mountain, 1,800 feet of granite above them, uh, ventilation systems, et cetera. They're isolated from their families, they're isolated from the society, from the sense of being vulnerable to the virus. And we're doing those kind of extreme measures just to ensure that we will maintain the ability to defend our great nation. Three threats as well. The United States military can walk and chew gum at the same time. Is that correct? That, that's, that's a great way to say it. And I'll tell you what, we are, we are focused like a laser in the support that we can bring our nation with respect to combating COVID-19. 
but at the same time, our enduring mission of defending our homeland and doing all the things that our American public and for the NORAD, which is a binational command with Canada, that our both uh, Canadian and, and U.S. citizens uh, expect us to do. And we're going to make sure that we will be able to endure through the COVID-19 and be able to defend our homelands. General Terence O'Shaughnessy, thank you very much for joining us from Colorado Springs. 